we uh, talk today is about the uh, financial crisis of 2008. And some, I'm going to also talk a bit more about the, um, I guess we can call it a recovery because it's not really a recession, but it's not much of a recovery either that followed the, uh, the financial crisis. And I think we can just take a step back first and think of what we know about the financial crisis. Pretty much what we know, or what maybe you people know more, but most people know that it was all about greedy Wall Street bankers, right? It was caused by greedy Wall Street bankers who suddenly, apparently, became greedy in 2008. Right? They weren't greedy before, apparently, because they didn't have a financial crisis in 1998. They didn't have a financial crisis in 1993. So they mustn't have been greedy back then. Right? If greed is what caused this, then greed must have suddenly overcame or overcome these bankers, and then they collapsed the system. They flipped the switch, and the system collapsed. Uh, well, that's obviously idiotic, uh, although it's not obvious just that I said it. Um, because I think we can assume, and it might not be true for every, every single Wall Street banker, but just take the working assumption that everyone on Wall Street forever has always wanted every dollar you have, right? So assume pure, absolute greed, they want everything you have. That's probably not too far from the truth. But that has always been the case. It was the case 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it's the case today, it was the case in 2008. So greed by Wall Street bankers could not have been the cause of the financial crash because it's there all the time, and the financial crash isn't there all of the time. So it must have been something else. Right? Their greed or their uh, profit maximization must have been occurring in a different environment than at other times. Right? Now, the environment that I'd like to talk about is how much of U.S. policy is geared towards home ownership. And not only uh, home ownership, but also home, home ownership for those who uh, are low income and perhaps can't normally afford to buy a home. And so I'll just run down uh, some of the policies that have been in place for, uh, for quite a while, actually, to promote uh, home ownership. And first, the reason I'm going to talk about home ownership as the key to the financial crisis, if you look at chart one that you have there, it shows the... <laughs> It shows the run-up to uh, of, of housing prices from 1993 up through July of 2012. Okay, and I'll show that on the video. And what you see is that through the early 2000s, house prices just shot up rapidly. Right, the rate of increase just went up dramatically, and by around July of 2005 or late 2005, house prices were more than double what they were in January of 2000. So in four or five years time, five to six years time, house prices had more than doubled on average across the United States. Right now, technically that may or may not be called a bubble. Economists argue about this because it's, I don't know, it seems worth arguing about. <laughs> but there was something wrong. Right? There's something wrong, there's some artificial inflation of house prices that occurred. All right? That inflation in house prices didn't occur just because of Wall Street bankers. What was going on that might have helped to spur this rapid increase in house prices? Well, and also to show you how housing was really key to the financial crisis, uh, let me just give you some numbers. In 1995, the United States was building 1.4 million new single-family homes per year, so 1.4 million. By 2005, we were building 2.2 million, so that's quite a, a big increase in 10 years' time. And then in 2011, so this is after the financial crisis and even a couple years uh, into the recession or out of the recession, we were still we were building only half a million housing uh, single housing units a year. So about a third of what we were doing in 1995. So there's a huge run up in building of houses, built of house prices, and then there was a collapse of housing construction, housing market, and also wider uh, financial market that had effects throughout the, the economy. Right, and other associated uh, problems that came from this were 
uh, increases in foreclosures. You know, people were not able to pay their mortgage, so they were their home was foreclosed upon. And uh, also, there are a lot of people, including myself, for a period, who were in negative equity. Suddenly, their house price went down for no fault of their own, uh, because the system, the financial, uh, the house prices just collapsed. But it's had equity that was uh, worth now more than the, uh, the value of the, of the house. So this caused uh, problems for lots of people. And then, of course, there was a, because the financial system had some trouble, there were some broader effects on the economy. But the real economy, kind of the physical economy, kind of started collapsing in terms of the, the housing markets. All right, now, what are the policy things out there that might have maybe created an environment in which a housing run-up or bubble like this could have occurred. Well, just to run down some things that have been in place for quite a while, one is that uh, the mortgage interest that a person pays, right, you borrow to buy a home, you pay some interest on that uh, mortgage, that is tax deductible. Right? You deduct that from your taxable income. Right? So if you're at the higher tax brackets, that's more than a third of your interest is basically paid for by the federal government in the terms of a, a tax break. Right? So that's a, a pretty big incentive to get a quarter to a third or so of your mortgage interest uh, as a write-off from uh, federal taxes. And of course, this reduces your your uh, uh, federal tax in taxable income and that affects your state taxes also. So there's a huge uh, tax advantage to home ownership and to borrowing, right? to keeping as, as high a mortgage as you can. Uh, other things, uh, there are two entities, or actually three entities, two of them are much larger than the other, called Government Sponsored Enterprises, or GSEs, that exist primarily to uh, facilitate and subsidize uh, housing mortgages. So they back up the mortgage uh, market. So these are Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and they're, they do basically the same thing, and they are both private firms that are, uh, have an implicit guarantee from the federal government, a, a guarantee that was actually exercised when uh, they were in financial trouble also during the financial crisis. And their role in the financial crisis, we'll talk about, is that what they do is they buy mortgages from the market and hold on to them, right? But unlike regular banks who also can hold mortgages, they have, since they're government-sponsored entities, they have this implicit backing of the federal government. So if all the mortgages go crap, then the federal government will step in and help them. And regular bank doesn't necessarily have that type of guarantee. So Fannie and Freddie would buy these things, get the return. The private return would be given to their shareholders as private profit, but the risk was borne by uh, taxpayers. So it's a, a pretty good deal. And it's basically run by uh, political, it's by political appointees and cronies, so it's uh, it's quite a sweet deal to be an employee, or at least the higher ups in these things. And the third GSE is the FHA, which is the Federal Home Loan Association, I what that is, which is smaller, and they they're smaller because they had tighter regulations, and they were they're actually a federal uh, entity, which has grown uh, <coughs> since the financial crash because Fannie and Freddie. Were, there were more rains on Fannie and Freddie, so the FHA stepped in. And uh, that, now, if there's going to be a problem, it's going to be the FHA that needs bailing out. All right, so we have the tax advantages to home ownership. We have the GSEs, whose job is to prop up the mortgage market. And then also we have the Community Reinvestment Act. Now, the other parts, the other two parts I mentioned of this, this policy framework were pretty much, they apply to everybody. They support mortgages and house or home ownership for whatever income level. But the Community Reinvestment Act is a set series of rules that got more and more strict over time, which were designed to put low income and minorities or under underserved communities into homes that they would own. Right, so the Community Reinvestment Act was passed in 1977, and it required that banks increase their lending in risky areas. Right, so without this, people, the banks would look at risky areas. It's called redlining. Right? They would look at a map of the city, and different areas of the city would be have a red line, 
and say, well, that's a very risky area, so we're not going to lend to anyone who wants to buy in that area. Well, it turns out many people in the redlined areas were minorities, so the Community Reinvestment Act was basically a, uh, an answer to the charge that this redlining was racist. Right? So banks were now required to hold or to make certain percentages of their mortgages into risky areas. Now these are areas that they decided as private entities not to enter because it was too risky. But now the law says they're required to enter these. So now they have to lower their lending standards to give mortgages to people that they don't want to give mortgages to, who are a higher risk bet in terms of, uh, of, of the banks. Now the problem is that initially this, the standards didn't have to be lowered very much. The requirement on banks was not that strict. But that was increased over time. So from 1977 through uh, the late 90s, the requirements kept rising. And by the late 90s, they were actually uh, pretty significant. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but a, a, a significant percentage of loans that banks made had to be made in risky areas because the federal government saw this act, the Community Reinvestment Act, as a way to push low-income people into home ownership. Right, through the private sector. Right? So making banks give them homes, basically. But of course, the banks were now taking on mortgages, right? making loans that they uh, didn't want to make, but were only making because of a, uh, a requirement from the federal government. Now, by the late 1990s, we also saw that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were being used to push more people into home ownership. Right, so they were pressured to accept higher shares of risky mortgages, also along with the regular uh, banks. So Fannie and Freddie were now forced to hold more risky mortgages. So you can see where this is going. Much of federal policy towards housing was pushing people who normally wouldn't be getting mortgages into having mortgages. Right, so make, forcing banks to make higher risk mortgages. Right, this, if this is starting to ring a bell about the collapse of the housing market, then that's, well, that's good. You're putting two and two together. <laughs> <laughs> now, Fannie and Freddie became uh, very large, and there was some push actually within the Federal Reserve, uh, Alan Greenspan, and also the uh, president of the Fed, St. Louis Fed at the time, who I worked with, uh, Bill Poole, were out talking about how there was a danger of these GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, that they were, uh, there was an implicit risk to the economy, they were getting too big, they had to be reined in, they had to uh, you know, get some more better controls on what they were doing. So in the early 2000s, the Bush administration did try to adjust the GSE rules, but Congress uh, refused. And so there were uh, hearings in Congress, in the Senate, and in the House. So mind you that the Senate, and the Senate Banking Committee was chaired by Christopher Dodd, the last name's going to come up later. Mm -hmm. And the House Banking Committee was chaired by Barney Frank. Mm -hmm. right? That last name will come up also a little bit later. They'll be said next to one another. <laughs> <laughs> and they were head of the committee. It was Democrats were in control of both, both houses at the time. I think it was both houses. And they killed the proposals to, uh, to, ref to rein in Fannie and Freddie. Now, Democrats were in favor of not, or, or they weren't in favor of reigning in Fannie and Freddie, and also some Republicans weren't, because Fannie and Freddie were, uh, and still are, very powerful politically. They're big, they're private firms, so they can donate uh, to candidates and so on. So they were influential, but at the time, the chairs of the committees were uh, Democrats. Now, um, more precisely, in September of 2003, in some hearings about whether or not Fannie and Freddie should be reined in, Barney Frank said that, and if you look at the charts I gave you, right, the second chart, it was September 23rd, 2003, to be precise. All right, and this chart shows the ratio of subprime mortgages to total mortgages. So this is, subprime mortgages are mortgages that are very risky, they're not prime mortgages, right? They're not really the best mortgages that banks like to give. They're subprime by some, uh, some standards. Well, on September 23rd, and I, for convenience, put a little arrow to indicate September 23rd on this chart, Barney Frank said that 
and said in the hearings about what to do with Fannie and Freddie that he was willing to roll the dice a bit more on this whole housing market thing. Okay, now that statement was made, and if you look at this chart, that statement was made at the bottom of that little line there, which spiked up immediately. Right? So by the fourth quarter and the first quarter of 2004, the percentage of home loans that were subprime rose from about 3.5% uh, to uh, close to 11%. Right? So tripling the share of subprime mortgages immediately in the wake of Barney Frank saying that he was willing to roll the dice on Fannie and Freddie, which of course signaled to Fannie and Freddie that you know, Congress was going to back them up no matter what they did. So what Fannie and Freddie did was they signaled to the markets that they were going to buy any crap mortgages that were out there. Right? Fannie and Freddie, their job to prop up the market was to buy mortgages from banks. Right? So if you go to a mortgage broker, uh, you get a mortgage, most often that mortgage broker will immediately sell the mortgage. The mortgage broker is not the one who holds the debt. They'll sell the mortgage to a bank and then the bank might, especially smaller banks, will sell it to Fannie and Freddie or the mortgages will be packed together in some securities and then divided up. So it's a whole a big mess of securities. But Fannie and Freddie's job is to buy all of those up. All right, so you see if there's a signal that Congress is not willing to rein in Fannie and Freddie and wants to turn a blind eye and has the positive policy of making or having Fannie and Freddie do more risky things, then more risky things will, will be allowed. All right, so, so far we don't have any greedy Wall Street bankers involved. We do have some greedy uh, congressmen because I might also note that uh, there are political connections involved here, unsurprisingly. Countrywide Mortgage was a very large mortgage company, and at one point in the, during this housing boom, were responsible for 20% of the U.S. mortgage market. Now, the first name of the, I forget his last name now, uh, of the head of Countrywide who founded it, his name is Angelo something, there was a list in this office called the Friends of Angelo. The list, Friends of Angelo, included people who would get really great mortgage deals if they called and said, I'm a friend of Angelo's and I'd like a mortgage on my home. Well, Christopher Dodd was a very, very good friend of Angelo. No <laughs> way. So, I don't want to, you know, point any fingers here, but, well, you can point your fingers. <laughs> Okay, so there was a lot more risk being taken and this risk was encouraged and subsidized by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac with the implicit backing of the federal government and the supposed regulators, meaning Congress, were telling them that they were going to turn a blind eye to whatever risk that they were uh, going to take. All right, now, Another important factor during all of this was the Federal Reserve. Now we heard about this the other day from uh, Robert Higgs, who talked about how the Federal Reserve was trying to cause a housing bubble, and I think he was mistaken in that. Um, in terms of what the Fed was trying to do, I was at the Fed at the time, and what the Fed was trying to do was was not very uh, wasn't the right thing, I don't think. But it wasn't. They weren't trying to boost the housing market in particular. They were happy that the housing market was booming. But Fed policy during the late, or the early 2000s, when there was a, a recession in 2001, was to keep interest rates very, very low. And just like now, they would commit to keeping them very low until the economy recovered. Right? My own belief was that they were, by forcing the interest rates so low, they were actually suppressing the economy. But conventional monetary wisdom is to keep interest rates low to get the economy going. And the housing market was actually going pretty well through the recession, so that didn't need any, any help, much help from the Fed. But the Fed was happy that the housing market was doing well because that was part of the getting the economy moving. So the Fed was trying to get the economy going by cutting interest rates. 
They weren't specifically trying to get uh, a housing bubble. But even if they were completely innocent in terms of what they were trying to do, they, the mortgage rates were just historically, they were very, very low during this period because of Fed policy. So now we have very low mortgage rates. We have, from the Fed, because of the Fed action, we have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac signaling because the Congress has told them that anything goes. So riskier and riskier mortgages can be made. Interest rates are already low. We're already subsidizing mortgages with, um, uh, with tax breaks. So more and more people will be getting mortgages and buying houses who otherwise wouldn't. Also, more people can um, borrow on their house, right? House prices are going up. So if you have an old mortgage for $100,000, your house goes up from $150,000 to $200,000. That's $50,000 extra in, in cash, basically. So a lot of people were cashing in their equity on their home and uh, spending that. Right. So, and that, you know, still feeding the, uh, the number of mortgages that are, that are out there. And more risky people can, can do that because there were lots of changes in mortgage standards uh, through this time. And I'll just run them down, or give a rundown of some of the changes in the housing market. First is that there was an increase in the number of adjustable rate mortgages. And uh, often these would have uh, teaser rates. So you can get a, a mortgage that might have, I don't know, one and a half, two percent interest for the first three years. Then after three years, the interest rate goes up to five percent, something like that, or, or higher. So it has a teaser rate. So it's an adjustable rate mortgage. Most mortgages in the US historically have been fixed rate. Right? So for 30 years, it's the same interest rate. But these were adjustable rate mortgages. And uh, with the teaser, so people for the first few years had very low, um, artificially low uh, mortgage payments. Right, there's also a big increase in the number of subprime loans. We talked about why that might have been. Uh, banks knew if they made a subprime loan, right, they lent to someone they otherwise wouldn't. Now, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac would just buy these through some channel. So there was no risk to the bank to doing that because Fannie and Freddie Mac were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were taking the risk. And there was also uh, loosening of rules uh, and standards. So there were things called no doc loans. A no doc loan is that it's not no doctors, it's no documents. Now, most often when you go to get a mortgage, I know I had to do this whenever I got a mortgage, and I say my income is whatever paltry income it is. Uh, they say, okay, well, you have to prove that because we don't believe you can survive on that. that income. <laughs> so I have to bring documents, my tax documents for several years, uh, my bank statements, all sorts of things, letters from my employer and so on. Well, that's apparently very old fashioned because it was possible during, um, say, 2003 to 2007 to get a mortgage without any documents other than the application to apply for a mortgage. Right? You wrote down your income, and then your mortgage, whether you were approved or not, was based on that income level that you wrote down. Now, um, you might think it would be cynical to think, say that people would lie on that form. I mean, that's <laughs> absurd. For one, uh, there is a, supposed to be a check to it, because they, if you lie and say, I make $100,000 and you only make $20,000, then you get a big mortgage, well now you're stuck with a big mortgage and you have to make the payments. Okay, well it turns out they didn't have to make the payments in the end. But, there's still a lot of evidence that people lied even though they were getting themselves in over their head. Now, there was, were some, um, some researchers who went in and looked at the paper documents, right? The, the numbers on, on applications are available, you know, that's scanned in. But they went and they found the actual written applications. So they examined these paper applications, and what they noticed was an alarming amount of whiteout <laughs> being used on the application, especially in the income box. So you can imagine what might have been happening. You're you don't make very much money, you go to, you're at the mortgage broker, and you write the, fill in the application, honestly perhaps, and you say you make a certain amount, and you give the 
you know, you slide the application over to the broker and the broker says, oh, I can't give you a mortgage for that house at this income. And then he slides it back to you and there's a thing of whiteout sitting on the table next to you. And you guys know, might not even know what whiteout is. <laughs> but it's basically white paint that you put over a mistake and then you can write on top of it. Right? So there's a lot of this whiteout in the income box and you can see perhaps the whiteout right there. You could then you know, paint over the income you wrote, put in a higher number, slide it over, and then the broker says, oh, you can get a mortgage at this income. Uh, and then, you, boom, you have a mortgage. You don't have to prove your income. Right? That's a no-doc mortgage. And uh, there was an alarming amount of consumer fraud going on. So it wasn't just greedy Wall Street bankers. It was greedy people trying to get into, uh, trying to get mortgages that uh, they couldn't afford. And in many cases, had no intention of heading back. Because there were a large number of houses that were bought, mortgages were taken out, where there wasn't a single payment made. Right? And just because of the legal process, it would take a year or so to get you out of that house. So you could live for free for a year. And you figure, well, I just got that, that mortgage without having to prove my income. They didn't even check my credit. Well, in a year, when they finally throw me out of this house, I'll go get another mortgage and live for free for another year. Uh, so you might see some, some problems brewing if you were an observer of the uh, housing market and the the mortgage market during this time. Other things that happened were 100% um, mortgages, or greater than 100% mortgages. Now a mortgage is usually considered a secured loan, meaning that it's backed up by the home. Right? So if you fail to pay, then the bank can repossess your house. Right? So then they sell the house, and they, so they have some this securitized loan. Now, if you have more than 100% of the value of the house as a loan, then it's not 100% securitized. Right? You can get 125% mortgage, but if you fail to make your payments, the bank can seize your home, they're out, you know, the extra, the top 25% of that, or whatever over the value. But that became uh, something that you could do. Now, if you look at the second chart, okay, we're talking about subprime mortgage originations. There was also an increase in non-securitized mortgages. Right, so subprimes chair of the entire mortgage market in 2006. Well, 2004, remember, in 2003 it was 8.3%. That was when uh, Barney Frank said he was willing to roll the dice. And that was our dice, by the way. 2004 is up to 21%, then close to 23%, and then in 2006, 23.5% of the mortgages out there were subprime. Um, most were securitized, meaning that the value of the home was at least equal to the value of the mortgage, or the other way around. But then there were increasing shares of subprime loans, or loans that were of higher value than the, the home. All right, and then of course that shrunk pretty quickly in 2007, 2008, when uh, that's when it all, all hit the fan. All right, now, if you turn to chart three, it's, it's a chart. Three, actually, go to the last chart. Now, this has, shows two things. The, uh, the bars, the dark bars, this is dollars of equity cashed out. Remember I said you could cash out your equity, right? If the value of your home goes up above your mortgage value, that's equity. You can cash out. You can refinance and get cash out of your mortgage. So you can see a huge run-up in 2005, 6, and 7 in people cashing out, right? Those big black bars, all black bars, that's the amount of cash people were taking out of their mortgages. At the same time, Right, that line is the number of refinances. So that actually shrunk. People were refinancing, but the, um, at lower rates, but the amount of cash being taken out was huge. Right? Because now you could get 100%, 125% of the value of your home. So you could cash out 
everything. Right? In normal times, the way it used to be and the way it is in, say, Canada, you can't have a mortgage that's worth more than 80% of your, your home. In the U.S., it was subsidized, and there are all sorts of things that so go to 95%. You have to pay a higher rate. But now, that was a special case. You had to get insurance to protect the bank. Uh, but in this environment, that was out the window, basically. And you can get over 100% borrowing, so you cash out. You know, it's free money, very low interest rates. Um, a bank will give it to you because they're just selling it to Fannie and Freddie. You get all this cash. And the house prices keep going up. So you can keep living on, uh, on your equity, or so so, they, so people thought. Uh, just a story, a friend of mine is, in, lives in Santa Barbara, and he bought a house uh, for this was about in 2006. So the housing market in Santa Barbara had collapsed, actually. But Santa Barbara is heaven on earth, so it's very expensive to live there. He bought, I don't know, it was a three-bedroom ranch or something for $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. It's a very nice kitchen. So it was maybe worth it. <laughs> but uh, the house had been built in, say, 1966, and its original value was $25,000. Right. So then he bought it later, decades later, for $1.2 million. And it was the same owner who bought the house in 1966 who was now selling it to him, and he was retiring and leaving. Uh, the mortgage that the, the seller had on the house was $1.2 million. So he didn't get the mortgage of 25000 pay it off, and then sell it and get all that profit when he sold it. He had an entire mortgage. He had to use all of that to pay off the mortgage he had on the house. And he probably took a bath because it may have been worth double that a year earlier. Right, so here he is retiring, and he had been consuming off of the equity the artificial run-up in, in his house price. All right, now it's not, uh, not uncommon at all. Uh, now also, because subprime is really the key to all of this, if you look at the, the second chart now, this is mortgage delinquencies. These are mortgages that uh, people either were late paying after 90 days or had been into foreclosure. You see the different types of mortgages and the share of the total foreclosures, subprime, Mortgages with adjustable rates, remember I said these adjustable rates with teasers were problematic. They accounted for 40% of the uh, delinquencies that happened after the crash. Then it was a subprime with fixed rate, was about 20%. Prime rates, so these were regular interest rates, but with adjustable rates, also a big problem, close to 20%. And prime fixed rate, which is a more the traditional mortgage, uh, was something in the order of 5%. Now that was much higher than normal because well things have, had housing prices had collapsed. So even if you had a prime mortgage at a fixed rate and you were doing sensible things, your house price still went down. So you might have uh, uh, had and you may have lost your job because there was a recession. So there was a, a <coughs> jump in delinquencies even from that that time. All right. So remember, it was all caused by greedy Wall Street bankers. who somehow also, in 2005 and 6, oh, by the way, so uh, one last kind of fact here. In 2008, right, which is the year of the financial collapse, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, remember the two GSEs who were backing the uh, mortgage market and were signaled to take on all the, the risk they could, they were, where they were rolling the dice, own 74% of all subprime mortgages. All right, so subprime mortgages were out there. They were a huge percentage now, well, a much more uncomfortable percentage than we were used to. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were obviously backing that because they had bought 74% of all of those subprime mortgages. Okay, so subprime mortgages were key to the run-up in house prices, the loosening of standards, all of that is because of Congress and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in an environment of the Fed keeping interest rates low. And by the time of the collapse, Fannie and Freddie owned three quarters of subprime mortgages. All right. Now, if this kept going forever, I guess this was great. They had it all figured out. Keep interest rates low. You can have house prices just keep going up forever and ever and ever. 
Uh, but it didn't uh, keep going because there are other things that happened. There were two things that kind of burst the, the, the bubble, if you want to call it a bubble. Uh, one is that oil prices were shooting up and oil prices in 2006 were up to $144 a barrel. Now they're, actually I don't know what they are, we don't even pay that much attention anymore because they're not, not nearly that high. But oil prices were spiking up and oil prices are usually spiking up right before the United States have, has recessions. Most recessions in the US are preceded by a big spike in oil prices. And uh, I haven't seen any formal analysis of this, but I know some economists who had the theory that uh, it was this burst in oil prices, there was a ship run up in oil prices that caused the housing boom to collapse because the center of the collapse of subprime mortgages and the housing market was in uh, um, the Los Angeles area. Actually, it's the area east of Los Angeles where uh, people were commuting into Los Angeles and they were buying large homes in, say, uh, I forget the name of the place now. But, uh, you know, but once gas prices went up because oil prices were going up, it's now too expensive to commute from that far out. So there was no longer a big demand for those houses. They were building houses fast, the people were buying them fast and getting these mortgages to do it. Suddenly the demand for those houses were depressed because housing prices really shot up and gas prices really shot up. And then suddenly the whole thing ravels, it unravels because this housing market collapses, then it spreads, and then it goes through the rest of the country. Those, that's one possibility. But also at the same time, the Fed uh, decided to increase interest rates, and they did so pretty rapidly. And, okay, so I was at the Fed at the time, and I was saying at the time that uh, they were responding to a wrong signal. Oil prices were going up, and this was causing food prices and other prices to rise, but the Fed was not causing oil prices to go up. Right? Monetary policy was not causing that increase in average prices, it was oil prices. But the Fed read this as inflation that was that they had kept the interest rates too low and were causing inflation. But it wasn't monetary inflation, it was real inflation. It was changes in relative prices. But the Fed reacted by rapidly increasing the interest rate. All right? So now they've reversed course, mortgage rates go up, interest rates are higher, now, you, people can't buy, get out those mortgages at as low rates they could. Demand for houses goes down. Also, you, oil prices are higher, you can't commute because it's too expensive, and the whole thing unravels. Housing markets around the country start uh, having trouble, and they're in the areas of the country where they had gone up uh, uh, very rapidly, like Southern California, uh, Southern Florida, um, places like that that had uh, you know huge, huge increases in in house prices. All right, so then this hits the financial system. And hits the financial system because banks are holding these mortgage backed securities. They're holding securities that are part, you know, they're backed by mortgages. Right? So the value of these depends on the value of these mortgages. And with the housing market collapsing, and if, again if you look back at the first chart, house prices start falling and through the middle of 2008 they're now down basically um, a quarter. Well, they went from the index of 225 down to 150. That's much bigger than a quarter. In a very short period of time. Now, if the value of your bank's balance sheet is based on mortgages, mortgage values, and now the houses that are supposedly backing those mortgages, the price of those are collapsing, then you're in, you're in trouble as a bank. Now, banks, also because the uh, mortgage-backed securities were all very complicated, you couldn't actually wind down these mortgages because they were, mortgages would be split, you'd have shares of mortgages, so it was these bundles of mortgages that you would have. So it wasn't like, oh, this is Joe Schmo's mortgage, he's failing, so this, this mortgage right here is bad. No, they're in a whole big bundle of mortgages, all the bundle rated as AAA prime, or AAA by Standard and Poor and other rating agencies, but it's full of mortgages that are collapsing, right? They're full of junk mortgages. Now, 
Still, this isn't a problem for a bank because banks have insurance. Right? Banks buy insurance just for this, these type of occasions. Now, all of you, if you own a car, you have auto insurance. Okay? Now, um, there might be two or three of you who have insurance with the same company, but out of the, I don't know how many of you are here, there might be 10 different insurance companies that are represented. Right? Now, that is a good thing in the insurance market because um, the risk is spread around among different companies. And also, what's the risk that all of you, well, maybe when you drive out of here, but <laughs> all of you getting a crash at the same time? Well, say that happens. There's a big pile up when you're, in, you're leaving the uh, boon home here. There's a big pile up. You all call your insurance companies. They're all different insurance companies. So each insurance company will be able to absorb the loss without noticing. But what if you are all with the same insurance company? All right now, that insurance company will be absorbing a big loss. The risk has not been spread. It's all coming down on one insurance company. Now, the problem with banking insurance was that the biggest player in the banking insurance market was a company called AIG. I think it's, is that American Insurance Group? No, American International Group. American International Group. So AIG owned, or had provided the insurance for many, many banks, and they were insuring all sorts of assets. So you have one insurance company banking huge amounts of banks, and all those banks are being hit at the same time by the same housing crash. Right? So that's like all of you <coughs> crashing on the way out here and having one insurance company, and uh, that insurance, and you guys are all of his clients, all of that company's clients. Well, that insurance company is not going to be able to pay all of you because they don't have their money just sitting in the, your insurance policy sitting in, a, in the back room and they just hand you a bag of cash, they have that invested in the very, I don't know, maybe in the very banks and security that they're insuring or something, I don't know. But it's just not going to work very well. And indeed it didn't. AIG uh, was going to go insolvent. AIG couldn't, couldn't pay off, which means banks couldn't make payments on their debt that they had. Their assets collapsed. They were counting on their insurance to pay that off so they could pay their uh, people who they owed money to. But that couldn't happen, so those people now don't have the money that are owed to them. They can't pay the people they owe because these securities are being exchanged all the time. So you're always making these transactions, but suddenly you can't do all the transactions because there's third-party risk. The third party, you know, someone else, you're dealing with someone, but there's a third party that they're dealing with which you don't know if they can pay the person you're dealing with. And there's a whole chain of this going on. And this was also happening with firms because firms could no, now couldn't just borrow from banks very easily to make their, um, their payments. And there's a market for this. They buy, borrow from each other. It's called the commercial paper market, where companies that have excess uh, money at some time will lend money to other companies for short terms. And the volume of this market just collapsed, right? Because you wouldn't. If you were a company, you're not sure if people who owe you money are going to pay you. So you're not going to lend out money in this commercial paper market to someone who may not be able to pay you, even if they're trustworthy, because they might not be able to get payment. So there's a lot of third party risk, and uh, the market was not uh, functioning as nicely as normally would have happened. And this is where it hits the real market, because now firms that actually produce things is no longer a financial crisis, but it's a real economy crisis. First, it's the housing market's collapsing, so housing construction is going down. A lot of construction workers laid off. Now, also, regular firms who have nothing to do with this are having trouble. You can't, they can't borrow money to do what they need to do, you know, and they uh, uh, start uh, laying off people and so on, and the whole thing uh, starts going to crap. All right, and in the middle of all this, there was a presidential election, which uh, didn't help things. But the response to this was, uh, was massive from the federal government. Uh, it was a partnership, really, between the Federal Reserve and the uh, Treasury, the U.S. Treasury. There, were, uh, there was a long list of um, acronyms that were, that were flying around on what they were doing. And a lot of it, the, the Fed was trying to guarantee markets, like backing markets. And sometimes this didn't cost anything. Right? The Fed could just say, 
because the Fed can print infinite amounts of money. Right? So uh, they could say, we can, we'll guarantee the commercial paper market. Right? If you make a borrow in the commercial paper, we'll guarantee it. Well, that means that there's, there can be trust, greater trust in the market, so things settle down, and then they don't actually have to, the Fed doesn't actually have to pay any money. They just backed it, so then the market, market trust returns, confidence returns, and then, um, then things can return to something like normal. So the Fed was doing a lot of that, but they were also buying lots and lots of assets. Uh, Fannie and Freddie were buying assets. Fannie and Freddie were nationalized. Uh, banks were being wound down. There was not a very good bankruptcy system in place for banks to wind down. The Fed and the Treasury were lending money to healthy banks to buy unhealthy banks. Lots of bank consolidation. Uh, so huge things going on, and um, a, basically a slush, a slush fund to finance all this called TARP, which, um, which again was a, a partnership of, with the Fed and the uh, Treasury and you know everyone was involved in this. And the idea was, well, we don't know what's going to happen. We just have to give us this big fund of money, several hundred million dollars, this is billion, I guess billion dollars, to use for whatever purpose we need. And it's okay, go ahead. It's an emergency which is kind of a reasonable thing at the time, if it's a real emergency. Um, but then there were all sorts of deals. You know, so TARP itself, I actually think was a pretty, not, not too bad of a policy because it did kind of prop up the financial market and didn't make things worse. But a lot of the individual deals were really, really horrible. Large banks didn't take a haircut on their debt, right? They got 100% backing, right? They were able to sell their bad securities to the Fed with at 100%. Right? They didn't have to take a, a haircut on that at all. Uh, so a lot of that is, is pretty uh, pretty unseemly. And there was a lot of unseemliness into TARP, although I think behind it there were some um, decent, uh, decent principles. But things were going very fast and furious, and it was definitely flying by the seat of your pants. <coughs> and like I said, I was at the Fed at the time, and uh, some of you may have had uh, uh, Professor Anderson for class, he was there too, and he knew what was going on. He knew what all the acronyms meant, and he was telling us what they meant. Uh, and I barely remembered it after we left the room, but he probably remembers <laughs> it to this day. Oh, I bet he does. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll tell you all, just ask him, I'll rattle him off for you. Uh, so, you know, the TARP actually now has a really bad name to it, and a lot of it did really stink to high heaven. But um, there was some actual uh, sound economics behind it, because one of the things the Fed's supposed to do is to, um, you know, back banks when they're in trouble to prevent bank panics, and perhaps that happened. I know Robert Higgs the other day said that the Fed did nothing of the sort. I think that he's incorrect in that. I think that the Fed did actually rescue the economy uh, despite itself. But after all, they were involved in getting us in there, so if they got us in there, they're the ones who should get us out. <laughs> Um, now, that leads me to, so that, then we have this problem, um, and then, then we have a recession, and then since then, uh, there were a large number of policies that were put in place by the administra Obama administration and the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve uh, has kept interest rates extremely low um, for you know, since then, <coughs> and they have been signaling that they're going to continue that for a while. They've been basically printing money to prop up the system, and what's been propped up is the stock market. Right? Employment has really not picked up at all. Although the recession ended technically in July of 2009, uh, employment growth is averaging think, less than 200,000 even once it started picking up, and people are overjoyed, or the press is overjoyed, and the president claims victory when it hits 200,000. Now you need about 120,000 or so, give or take, just to replace population growth. Right, so if you're not hitting 120,000, then you're not even replacing new entrants into the market who might want jobs. So anything under that is a loss. And if we've been going at 200,000, uh, I think by 2025, 2030, something like that is when we'll recover the jobs that we would have had if the recession hadn't occurred. So it'll take a decade or longer to recover at that rate, which people are very happy with, and we barely ever get to that rate. Now, 
I don't want to go through the long list of uh, policies, economic policies that have been pursued that obviously have failed. But uh, my own view is that uh, there may be a policy that I, I thought was, that I think is a good idea, but I don't, no, none come to mind. But I think every single economic policy that's been followed to get us out of the recession or recover from this recession has been uh, ineffective at best and mostly harmful. All right, we can run down a long list of those problems we face now. Why hasn't things taken off? Well, on the financial so the fiscal side, the federal government, um, the stimulus package was a huge waste of money. Even if you believe, so they spent close to $800 billion on a stimulus package in 2009. Even if you believe in the Keynesian model that you can stimulate the economy by putting money in people's pockets and magically things occur and the economy grows, the worst thing you could do is to earmark it towards specific things. Right, to spend $300 billion subsidizing green energy. Right? Subsidizing things that are a complete waste of money. Building roads that may or may not be needed that don't occur for another year or two. If you believe in a Keynesian stimulus, that means you get money in people's hands and have them spend it. So you can write checks and just hand people money. Or give tax breaks, money goes into people's hands, they then spend it. If you believe in a Keynesian stimulus, then that's the way to do it. But even for Keynesians, they did the opposite of what they should have done. They spent the money on pet projects and wasteful projects and inefficient projects and diverted resources to things that were not going to get the economy growing. In fact, were going to drive the economy down, subsidize. A lot of the stimulus money was actually just a subsidy of local governments, so that state and local governments wouldn't have to cut spending. It wasn't actually stimulus, it was propping up of state and local governments. Again, um, really bad Keynesians even. Although there are Keynesians, Paul Krugman says it doesn't matter. It matters how much money is out there, it doesn't matter what you spend it on, and that's obviously idiotic. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of policy uncertainty. You know, you never know one year or the next what tax rate's going to be. Um, Obamacare, of course, increases the uncertainty and uh, the cost of hiring people, lots of other distortions, and so on. So we're not in a very, very good place. And also the Fed, I think the Fed should have increased the interest rates once the crisis had passed to get to some sort of a normal situation in mid-2009. Even they got it up to 2%, 1.5%, something like that. Then... Um, they could maybe uh, be a bit more normal now. But they're distorting the market so much, now we have the stock market up over 16,000, even though firm, you know, real output is not rising very fast. So there's something very artificial about what's going on in the stock market. Okay, so remember, it was greedy bankers that got us into all of this. Um, so the answer to the question of this conference, and this is the last session, is, is government the problem? It's, uh, well, no, it's greedy bankers. I think I've proven that. <laughs> okay, so any, any questions? <laughs>